Hello and welcome to Good Game. I'm Nick Boy. And I'm Rad filling in for Hex because after all that 10th birthday partying, Nick, she's a little bit sick. Let's call it what it is, Rad. It's week long hangover. And look at us now, the B team are taking over. You can call yourself the B team, mate. I like to think of myself as the Rad team. Tonight on the show, we're going to be blasting up our engines, winding down our windows, throwing a shrimp on the Barbie, and going through that red dirt in Forza Horizon 3. Because it's set down under, mate. Core! Get a roo up ya! Cobba! Oh, Paul Hogan and questionable human rights immigration policies. Cork hats. Turn around when it is safe to do so. Plus, Nick, what do you get when you combine the director of Metroid Prime, the father of Mega Man, and the lead writer on the original Halo game? Well, Rad, with that sort of talent trifecta, I'd expect you get one of the greatest games of all time. Hey, kiddo. If you get this message before you go to sleep, sweet dreams. If not, wake up already. It's been 200 years. Plus, I will have a first look at the Tomorrow Children on PS4, which is a strange communist crafting game from the creators of the Pixel Junk series. But Red, let's get into it. Let's do it. Can you name the game for this week? Brad. At E3 a couple years ago, Microsoft debuted a game called Recall, which had me rather excited. It's got a cool female protagonist, yay, a robot dog companion, yay, all the makings of a very awesome game. And yet, with this setup, I feel like you're about to say it's not an awesome game. It is an awesome game? I can't read faces. Come on! <laughs> Ow! Dang it! <laughs> Well, I guess we'll have to do this the hard way. Gotcha! <gasps> Recall throws you into the future after a brief message tells you that some plague has ravaged Earth and now you're on a planet called Far Eden. Although I feel like desert wasteland is not exactly what I think of when I think of the word Eden. No, not at all. And I don't know if it's just become cool to be super minimalist with like context and setup, but it doesn't really give you much to go on here. I understand that this creates some mystery and the story unfolds on your journey, but personally I need something more to actually care about what I'm doing. In this you play Jewel. Kai Bren, core maintenance. Jewel Adams, atmospherics. What we do eventually discover is that Jewel is under instruction from her scientist father, played by acclaimed musician and vegetarian Moby. Is it actually Moby? No, to clarify, all bald people to me look exactly like Moby. But Jewel needs to find out what went wrong with this plan to terraform Far Eden into a place that makes it habitable for Earth's plaguey population. Plaguey Moby? I blame Moby. Don't we all? Yeah, I reckon that shit music is what killed everybody. <gasps> There are also robots everywhere, which were supposed to be for maintenance, but have now taken on the new task of death to all humans. So off you go into the desert, facing off against all manner of mechanical beasts. But Jewel has her own mechanical beast, a robot dog by the name of Mac. Mac is pretty cool because he can help you out in combat and dig for stuff when the game tells you to. Eventually, you do unlock other companions as well, like Seth. A mechanical spider who helps you climb and flings you around some pretty crazy platforming sections. We made it! But Mac is the best because Mac is a dog and dogs are awesome. Yes, that's true. Any game can be improved with a dog companion. And as you travel and scavenge, you'll unlock different parts to upgrade him and your other Corbot companions. <laughs> Recall is set in an overworld which connects you to different zones, but your range is quite limited as everything needs to be unlocked. Which is a shame because I just wanted to explore the world more. Yeah, the world and the whole game really had so much potential. Earlier this year at E3, TV's Bajo got to speak to Recall's lead writer, ex-Bungie dev Joseph Staten, and he had this to say. Writing Recall has been a really fun uh, change of pace for me in the kind of games that I usually write. The charm and fun of the game is that combination of the robots, the core bots that you choose to be with you, and the different things that you can do with them. 
We're working with KG Nabuni san of Mega Man fame, and the guys at Armature who are the leads on Metroid Prime. So if you know those two games and you smash them together, you get a hopefully really charming, fun action platformer called Record. It's an interesting concept, a unique setting, and an intriguing character, but I want to know more about her. But you almost immediately settle into this hypnotic zone of just battling robots and retrieving power cores to unlock doors. And that's how I'd sum this game up in a nutshell. I'd also sum this game up in a nutshell by saying PlayStation 2, because it feels like a game completely out of time. It's got platforming and shooting and racking up combos, but after the first few hours, that fun starts to become monotonous. And it kind of just blands out. Yeah, the combat's pretty uninspired. You have a weapon which you can charge with ammo, and you need to color code this to enemies that you're fighting for maximum effect. This requires a bit of juggling when facing off against multiple opponents who will change color mid-fight. But that just mainly feels gimmicky. Yeah, totally. Your main aim in every fight is to get the enemy's health low enough that you trigger a quick time finisher. This rips the power core out, keeping it intact for you to use later for crafting. Because if there's one thing I love, it's keeping the organs of my enemies. And it's pretty easy to get those organs because the game has an auto-targeting mechanic that at times makes the game just feel like it's kind of an on-rails light gun shooter. Especially when you're facing off against these mechanical flies or caterpillar-like robots where you just have to spam bullets at every section. You do have a shield break option to make use of as well, but after a while this all just feels like a total slog. Even the boss fights are repetitive, it's just about getting them cores. Although the cores that really matter are the prismatic ones. These are the ones that open the doors to the rest of the map. Only some doors require more than one core, or some need hidden core bots. So it becomes a game about collecting all the cores to open all the doors. And even though that rhymes, I hate it. It feels like lazy game design, and I wanted this game to be more. Yeah, it's really disappointing. But on the positive side, I do like the way the game looks. It has a real sort of Star Wars Force Awakens vibe to it. Yeah, I really loved the setting. And I also really like the way that Jewel moves as well. She uses jumps and double jumps and air dashes, and it makes navigating the environment super fun. I think those moments of aerial flying and occasional puzzle platforming were the most interesting bits in the game. Even if they were just in aid of collecting a bunch of little key things to open more doors. There's also a need to level up a certain amount before you can face the dungeons behind these doors, which results in more mindless, grindy robot shooting. What's behind door number one? It's more robots! More robots. This is just one of those games that has a really interesting concept, but they've just buried it under loads of collection quests and repetitious bloat and doors. And it becomes draining. And can we talk about the loading? Yes, we can. We reviewed this on Xbox One, and I thought Next Gen meant an end to long ass loading screens. But in this case, it's just a bigger world to load, so longer load times. It's terrible. Yeah, but it is incentive not to let Jewel die. Yeah, maybe we should have just stayed on Earth and let Moby kill us. Just close your eyes and say yes to Moby. What are you going to give it overall, Nick? Well, I really like the concept and the setting. I just wish they embraced it more than just window dressing. It feels like a really ambitious idea that's hampered by a fear of taking risks. So I'm going to give it a two. Hmm. I want to think that there's a great game in there somewhere. It's just locked behind about a gazillion doors. So I'm giving it two and a half. Oh, come here, boy. Doesn't look too bad. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's go home. Okay, Nick boy, it's time for a first play. Yes, let's see what this game has to offer me. And while he does that, I'm just gonna take himself a little nap. Oh, no, this does not actually work. Oh, yeah. The Tomorrow Children is the latest title from Q Games, famous for making the Pixel Junk series. But The Tomorrow Children is a very radical, very Russian departure from what we're used to seeing from these guys. And it's also just about the only title I can think of that is in some form of early access on PlayStation. So I thought I would jump in and take a look at what is going on. I don't know what's going on. There's something about the art style. I'm very uncomfortable. The world was destroyed and all that remains is a girl in her backpack and a television with a pre-recorded message. Ugh. Don't look at me. Brilliant! Use the subway station and head for town. Okay, so there is a town. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. Oh, it's got a map. Ministry of Labor. That's where I needed to go. 
Line up, of course. There's no one else here, but sure. Are you friendly? You can strengthen yourself by allocating points on the player info tab. I would love to just put points into knowing what the hell is going on. What is that thing? Wait, what? Why am I in prison? What did I do? Why did I turn to stone? What the f is going on? Okay, let's craft something. And crafting is a wood puzzle. Yes. I achieved something in this game. Just wait 45 minutes to rise out of the ground. This is the only thing I know. Watching television on a treadmill, I'm gonna leave it there. Okay, so that is the Tomorrow Children. I played the game for about an hour and I have barely an understanding of what is going on here. The basic premise seems to be that there's a town that you can contribute to, that you are part of this, this whole, you're a clone, and you need to make sure that this town continues to run for some reason. I guess to rebuild society after whatever big disaster happened. And the way that you contribute is you go and find materials that you can bring back. So food and things that you can use to build new buildings and infrastructure and that sort of thing. But then you also, in your town, you need to make sure that all of this stuff continues to work. So we saw at the end I build this treadmill and I can then ride that treadmill to generate power for the town to make sure that the town continues to work. The mining itself is going out and just you pickaxe something for what appears to be an extraordinarily long amount of time and then you pick up one piece of material and take it back to a storage area and then you go back and do that again. And I guess mining in real life isn't fun, so why should it be fun in a video game? And I feel like that's what the game is actually doing. The, the purpose of this game is the feeling that you are one of many and that you need to contribute to building up the society. And the only way you're going to do that is through like boring work, but we all share the boring work. Unfortunately, the boring work is also boring for the player. And I don't know if that's supposed to be a comment on the boring work or they've just not managed to make it particularly interesting. There are a lot of games out at the moment that involve crafting. And if you look at something like Minecraft, one of the joys of that game is the crafting. It's pretty much the main joy. And the difference between that and this is that the the crafting and the mining and the, and the manipulating the world there is actually really fun, it's quick, it's satisfying, and you instantly see a result. Here, there's not a mechanic I've encountered in the game yet where I can see myself being happy to do for another 30 hours. Even the way they're releasing the game is really strange. It's, it's on PS4, it's early access, but it's going to be free to play. But if you want to play it now, you pay $20. And you get a founder's pack with some extra stuff in it. It's kind of like you are paying for the privilege to work in the game. Which, it's, again, it's a very weird backwards kind of model, but, uh, but maybe it will work for them. The game has a very strong identity and obviously has a way that it wants me to play it. So I need to relinquish control of how I would normally play this kind of game and instead play it the way it wants to be played. Which also, weirdly, is the theme of the game. So that is my first play of The Tomorrow Children. Will there be a second play? Yes, because if I'm being honest, I don't feel like I've actually even had my first play yet. Maybe I'll just ride the treadmill a bit more though. I know how to do that at least. I tried for six months to get a job at Origin as a game designer or writer, and I went skydiving with the team. I went skydiving with Lord British uh, because a friend invited me along. You went skydiving with Lord British? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I. Uh, I played on the softball team, I played role-playing games in the board rooms at night, the meeting rooms, and uh, by the time I finally got hired, people were like, I thought you worked here six months ago, but, <laughs> but uh, I could not get a job. I failed over and over to get that, that job. And then there was an ad in the paper, wanted tester, $7 an hour. And my first boss was a woman named Kay Gilmore. She interviewed me and hired me, and I was like, oh wow, I tried for six months to get this job and couldn't. And then the test job opened, and pretty quickly after that, there was a position open working on System Shock. Orders of Showdown. All the access codes are changed on this floor. Idiot. Oh. 
And by the end of System Shock CD, I was the lead tester, and that's what it was all about for me because Looking Glasses games, Underworld specifically, were my draw. And so getting to work for 10 months with those guys on System Shock, the first one, was mind-blowing, and it was a dream come true, and that's how I got into games. Turn around when it is safe to do so. Hey, Cupcake. I met a fan last night. Said 50 of his friends were coming up from Sydney. We've traveled halfway across the world, and I can't believe we're finally here! Looking out the window, and I have to tell you, they have beaches here to take your breath. The Horizon Festival is back for its third outing, and this time it's brought the thunder down under. For those of you who don't know, Forza Horizon is a sort of music festival where everyone takes cars instead of drugs. And there's not a cop in sight to harsh your buzz. Yes, but before we get into the nitty gritty of the festival and the driving, let's talk about their take on Oz because it's a little bit stylized, isn't it? I certainly don't live in that country. A look at the map shows that the Outback is a quick 10 kilometer drive down the road from Surfers, while Byron Bay is just south of the Yarra Valley. I don't know where anything is, and even I know this is wrong, but whilst Forza fails in geography, it more than makes up for it in attention to detail. From little things like our wheelie bins, road signs, and the distinctive phone boxes of one particular telco, to the big picture stuff, like those grand Australian vistas. But I think we can forgive them for taking some liberties with the layout. If it was an even half accurate map of Australia, it would just be driving for hours between civilization and then being murdered by John Jarrett. Very true. Plus, by cramming it together, they've been able to create one of the best looking and most diverse driving sandboxes ever. Launching over sand dunes, ripping through the rainforest, 100 meters, turn left, or drifting around city streets. And it's more open and free to explore than ever. Yeah, and it's nice that they've skewed towards some lesser known regions too. They haven't snuck in a Harbour Bridge or Uluru for some easy iconography. However, there are kangaroos, but unlike in real life, they don't get stuck in your bonnet. Yeah, those guys will kill you. And I really liked that you could choose your avatar this time too, from a pretty diverse group of characters. Boss, the local press are asking for a photo. Help me out here. The problem is there just weren't enough to choose from. I wish that there was a way I could customize it more because it was just all like cool guys in beanies or just hot girls. And I'm I'm neither of those if two you people. Put a beanie on, that could be you. I'd be a cool guy. You could be a cool guy. You could be a cool guy. Is it just the beanie making me yeah, cool though? You know. You can also choose a name that the game will actually say to you in dialogue. Thank you. You could be a cool guy. Stop saying could be. <laughs> You know what you did. It's a pretty big list, but sadly, Rad wasn't an option. You'll have to call me Red now. Yeah, there was no Nick Boy either, but I could go with Bort, but I ended up just settling on Cupcake. So I'll call you Cupcake. You look like a cupcake. Thank you. They've also stripped back on the cutscenes and story almost completely. There's a slick intro video, and that's pretty much all you get. You still do have a couple of companions, yeah, though, with Kira, you your trusty Irish side. organizer. We're gonna head over that way now. And Warren, your Ocker car mechanic, keeping you company over comms throughout the game. Hey, look out, out of my way! I've got 800 horses here, I'm not afraid to use them! The characters in Past Forces were far too douchey to want to spend any time with, but Kira and Warren are undeniably tolerable. Just tolerable. Yeah, nothing more. She's not overly flirty, and Warren isn't too painfully Aussie. And they crack a nice few jokes every now and then too. Still alive, boss? 
One of the biggest changes is that you're in charge of the entire festival this time. Now, don't worry, this hasn't turned the game into a business management sim. The game is still primarily about driving cars in very unsafe ways. Yeah, as you complete races and events, along with the staples of XP and credits, you earn a new kind of currency. This time, it's fans. By reaching certain fan milestones, you'll unlock new spots to open festivals or upgrade existing ones, which unlocks races and challenges in that area. It's a good way to give you more control over what kind of racing you want to do. If you want to mess around with dune buggies in the desert, then focus on upgrading the outback location. Red sand, blue sky, perfect off-road terrain, and snakes that'll kill you if you even slow down for a second. Or, if you prefer street racing, improve your Surfers Paradise Festival. And apparently the waves aren't bad either. Most events will also cater to whatever you're driving at the time. So just rock up in whatever car you like, and you're set. And then if an event does ask you to use a different car, then say, screw you, event! I'm just gonna make my own event! I'm the captain now. Because you've now got access to blueprints, which let you design whatever challenge you want. You can set car restrictions, lap times, time of day, and weather, just about everything other than the route. So it's not a super powerful or deep editor, but it's a really nice addition. And every event also has a selection of other people's blueprints to choose from too. It's a super slick way of incorporating user-made content because it means you never need to actually search for it, it's just there if you want it. Yeah, though there are still some events that force you into specific cars. Is this how you put someone in the car? When I'm forcing them. Things like the bucket list challenges and the always spectacular showcase events, which put you up against ridiculous things like trains and speedboats. Right on time. You ready for this? And I did love all those slow-mo hero moments in showcases too. And I love all those new danger signs around the place, which are basically just huge stunt jumps. I did one 12 times just trying to beat a friend's score. Don't you think that's a bit much? No, I'm just that kind of guy. Just competitive? Mm-hmm. Well, that is in keeping with the spirit of Horizon's over-the-top sense of fun. That friend was you. I'm sorry, I need to tell you on television. Oh, what? And they're pretty much the only races where I enjoy simply going for a little drive. Sure, the races are fun, but mucking around between them is really where I had the best time. Yeah, it's a really good combination of having cool scenery to enjoy and then a bunch of really nice cars to enjoy it in. You have arrived at your destination. Cruise around slowly in an old convertible or feel your ring clench tight as you unleash the full power of a hypercar through traffic. There's even the Warthog from Halo as well. It's just a shame it didn't have the machine gun on the back. Yeah, you can give it sick rims at least. Yeah, I guess so. But the important thing is there's a bunch of distinctly Aussie cars here. I'll admit I don't know much about cars, but I know these are Aussie as, mate. Crikey. I'm sorry, that's pronounced crikey. <laughs> and with the always deep options of upgrading and tuning, you can now put on much more substantial body kits onto certain cars too. So for example, you can turn a basic WRX into a rally slaying machine. And I love how generous they are with the cars. Totally. If you've played past Forza games before, you'll get a bunch for free, and every time you level up, you get a chance to win one, and you get free ones for opening new festivals, and cheap ones for upgrading them, and you'll find them in barns. We're ready. It's just throwing cars at you to the point where I never actually needed to buy one. Yeah, it's hard to pick a car and just stay in it because there's always a new one that you want to try out. And a music festival about cars wouldn't be complete without some decent music, so what did you think about the soundtrack? Well, music is really subjective, but I really liked it, and I liked that there was a station dedicated to Aussie artists. I personally enjoyed the classics. Everything is more epic with a bit of Ode to Joy. <laughs> It's totally lame that you need to unlock the radio stations. Just give me the tunes. I know, right? But you can also add your own music now through Groove Music, and it's always more fun driving to your own musical podcasts. Of course, this game is also part of the Xbox Play Anywhere initiative, so if you buy it on Xbox, you get it on your Windows 10 PC for freezies. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to the PC version when we're recording this right now, but I am excited to get home and get it going on my good rig. Well, don't get too excited because you will still need to use the Windows Store to access it. 
you. Yeah. But it is great that there's crossplay between PC and Xbox, so you can play online with your friends no matter which platform they prefer. And you've got to give Microsoft credit because this sort of cross-platform online play is so rare, it's a great move on their behalf. And speaking of online, the usual plethora of online modes return, like Free Roam and The Adventures. Adventures! But the biggest new addition is a four-player campaign co-op, so you and your friends can work your way through the campaign together. And they've done it all super seamlessly. Anything you do in a friend's game will count towards your own solo progress, and the way it just sort of starts an online game exactly where you are in the world feels super sleek. This is online free roam. And of course, the ever perky driver tar system is back to put the digital spirit of all your friends into your game, even if you're playing offline. And you can now even recruit up to four of them into your lineup, which earns you a few extra credits and XP at the end of a race. Yeah, that feature seems slightly pointless to me. The bonuses they earned were barely enough for me to care, and I was hoping my team of fake friends and I could actually just do more stuff in game together. I agree. There are also a few upgrade trees now to work your way through. As you hoon around and race, you'll get skill points for your actions, which you can spend on various perks, abilities, and instant prizes. And one such ability is the drone camera, which lets you take off and explore the world with a drone! So you can live out the fantasy of being that dickhead with a drone. Yay! Annoyingly, it also seems to be the world's lowest flying drone, though, and can't go much higher than the roof of a car. But it is still a cool feature and is handy for exploring and trying to find hidden barns and collectibles. Yeah, I did feel like it was a slightly missed opportunity. Like, it would have been really cool if you could use them to make little films in-game or use them during replays or something. I feel like GTA V's editor has set a really high bar, and I just would have loved to see something like that in Forza. There's no dynamic replay camera, so you have to manually switch cameras yourself, and you can't save replays or share them in-game. It's a small complaint, but the game is just filled with so many glorious moments. I wish it was easier for me to share my glory. Well, I think you've shared enough of your glory, so let's wrap this up. What are you going to give it? Look, with the exception of The Simpsons Road Rage, this is probably my favourite racing game. It's so much fun, and there are a couple of little niggles here and there for me, but it's only because I'm really trying to find something wrong with it. I'm giving it four and a half stars. Hmm. It's got the depth of a sim racer and the insanity of the best arcade racers, so I'm going to give it five stars. We're just awarding stars. <laughs> Willy-nilly. Stars, stars, stars. I hope they put us on the box, but they call us Bardio and Hex. Because <laughs> then people will know who we are. ...and the train is leaving the station. Literally. This is going to be a race to remember. So, did you name the game for this week? It was Pixel Junk Eden on the PlayStation 3 from 2008. Controlling the Grimp, you leap from plant to plant to collect magical spectra in this rather minimalistic and atmospheric platformer. I love that game, and we chose it this week because it's developed by Q Games, who also made The Tomorrow Children, a game I do not love. I'm just very, very confused by. Well, Nick Boyhood can be a very confusing time in your life. Next week on the show, Hex will be back. Yes, but Rad, it's been very nice having you here. Thanks. And I say that from the position of power of also a temporary <laughs> fill-in host. Well, I'm just happy to be here. And next week, Hex and I will be diving into the Destiny expansion, Rise of Iron. Join me, Guardian, and become an Iron Lord. Plus, we will give you our verdict on FIFA 17's fancy new story mode. Not our verdict. No, no, no. Their verdict. Their verdict. I might not even be here. Who the hell knows what's going on with the no, host these no days? No one knows. Just don't get too dazzled. It can disappear just like that. Real opening now! And if you haven't gotten your Radley fill, you can catch more of me on Wellplay. Good Game's sometimes weekly eSports show. Well, that's why I was winning, right? <laughs> Which you can catch on iView. It's a fine show. And can I plug Pocket too? There's no time. Uh, there's no time. Until next time, Nick, bye out. Right out. Watch Pocket. I've been wanting to rub my eyes since we've started because I've had something in it yeah. since the morning. Can I go? I felt that energy. Oh, I think it's fine. Oh, my God. I mean, this is the problem with the patriarchy, right? That I, I don't care about it at all because I don't have any eye makeup on that I'm worried oh about rubbing. Gosh, this, this feels, feels good. So I've been doing good. this all day. This feels terrific. I can do this at any point. Stop. I'm doing both at the same time. Oh, this feels so good. I'm so happy right now.